So hello, um, welcome to tonight's panel discussion for the exhibition Hunter Gatherer, currently showing at Macintosh Gallery at Western University until December 10th. This panel discussion is co-presented with the Department of Visual Arts Art Now class. So welcome to all the students enrolled in Art Now and to their instructor, Liza Urich, uh, as well as everyone else joining in from elsewhere. Participating in tonight's panel, we have artists Nicholas Krombach, Emily Jan, and Philippa Jones. Uh, unfortunately, Meryl McMaster is not available to be with us tonight due to another commitment. Uh, I will, however, be showing a short video that talks about the work uh, of Meryl's that is included in, uh, in Hunter Gatherer, because I feel very strongly about the importance of her work in this exhibition, so I wanted to make sure that it was included, even if she's not here to talk about it in person. So before I start tonight's discussion, uh, I want to acknowledge that Western University is located on the traditional lands of the, uh, the Anishinaabek, the Haudenosaunee, uh, Lunapawak, and Chinonkton nations on lands connected with the London Township and Somber Treaties of 1796 and the Dish with One Spoon uh, Covenant Wampum. With this, we respect the longstanding relationships that Indigenous nations have to this land, as they are the original caretakers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit endure in Canada, and we accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation, as well as renewing respectful relationships with Indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. So there is much work to be done to right these wrongs of the past, and I believe that we all need to take some action, however small. Uh, for me personally, my contribution to redressing these past injustices is through my curatorial practice uh, and through the programming and community partnerships that we engage in at Macintosh Gallery. So tonight, first of all, I'm going to start out by talking a little bit about the exhibition, uh, and then I will uh, ask Nicholas, Emily, and Philippa to speak about their work, um, thinking about it in response to the themes of the exhibition, but also inviting, uh, inviting them to expand the discussion into their wider studio practices. And then after that, I'm going to show just a few images of Meryl's work installed in the gallery, and then we'll show a short video about her work. Uh, and then after that, we'll open uh, things up to the question to questions from the audience. Uh, so throughout the talk, uh, please feel free to enter your questions in the Q and A section. Uh, Emily, Nicholas, and Philippa, I of course want you guys to feel free to discuss things with one another uh, during the discussion part of the evening. Uh, I know that uh, some of you know each other already, um, and there is of course much much sympathy across your practices. Uh, so I expect that you'll have plenty to say to each other. And students uh, enrolled in Art Now, please don't sign off too quickly at the end because Liza has a little bit of housekeeping to do uh, with you guys. So when everybody who's um, not in Art Now goes, you guys have to stay, stay behind for a few minutes. So now uh, a little bit about the curatorial premise behind the exhibition. Hunter Gatherer is a meditation on the complex network of relationships between hunting and collecting in the context of the museum. With an emphasis on representations of the animal body, artists Nicholas Krombach, Emily Jan, Philippa Jones, and Meryl McMaster consider this dynamic from art historical and post-colonial perspectives. The exhibition creates points of intersection through references to sport hunting, acquisition, power, and dominance, decadence and, ex and excess, still life and vanitas paintings, and institutional critique. Depictions of the hunted animal body are common throughout art history, uh, particularly in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, uh, and are closely linked to the human desire for the control over nature. In addition, animals preserved through taxidermy are held in many natural history collections. Such specimens were often, often acquired by museums during a time when the expansion of natural history collections mirrored a, a period of colonial expansion. Hunting in the colonies was viewed as both sport and scientific pursuit, and many hunters justified their killing uh, by claiming an interest in scholarly pursuits and in acquiring specimens uh, for scientific collections. These hunted animals often uh, came to form the basis of collections in natural history museums, and such collections are now subject to a rethinking and reevaluating of their value and meaning, given that they can be perceived as metonymic to the colonial project itself. 
So the work that I selected for Hunter Gatherer uses textiles, sculpture, drawing, taxidermy, photography, and new media to address these interrelated concepts. With this exhibition, I in no way intend to glorify hunting, uh, but I do acknowledge its place in the history of museum collections, as well as its importance in both indigenous and settler food practices. So first we will hear from Nicholas Krombach and Nicholas, I invite you to say hello and share your screen when you're ready. Oh, wait, no, first, <laughs> first of all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read your bio, Nicholas, sorry. <laughs> uh, so yes, Nicholas, uh, throughout his practice, Nicholas Krombach explores animal, uh, human animal relationships, seamlessly combining animal imagery, art historical references and material culture. The works in this exhibition integrate references to game paintings, hunting trophies, heraldry, and Victorian architectural ornamentation with the critique of deeply entrenched power structures. Juxtaposing animal images and dog, uh, juxtaposing images of dogs and dead animals in the case of the work in this exhibition, so the hunter and the hunted, Krombach questions not only the hierarchies between humans and animals, but also the ongoing legacies that carry over from colonialism. Uh, Nicholas currently works in Kingston, Ontario. He has been awarded the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation Award uh, and is the recipient of grants from the Toronto Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, and the Canada Council for the Arts. In 2017, Krombach presented a solo exhibition uh, behind elegantly carved wooden doors at Art Muir in Montreal, uh, which received reviews in Border Crossings and V des Arts. The End of the Chase uh, traveled between uh, 2018 and 2019, exhibiting at New Art Projects in London, UK, Art Muir Berlin, and Art Muir Montreal. In 2019, Krombach produced an exhibition of collaborative works with artist Nouriel Stern entitled Whale Fall, presented at the Canadian, the Canadian Clay and Glass Gallery in Waterloo. He has been awarded several major commissions for, for public sculpture, including Billy, Nanny and the Kids in Burlington, Ontario, uh, and Horse and Cart, located in Victoria Park, Kingston, Ontario. He is currently working on Flock for Niagara Falls Exchange in Niagara Falls, and Wind Vane for Florence Carlyle Park in Woodstock, Ontario. Uh, from 2016 to 2017, Krombach participated in a year-long residency at the Florence Trust in London, England. And this past summer, he was artist in residence at the studios at Mass Mocha in North Adams, Massachusetts. So with that, now, Nicholas, now I do really, truly invite you to share your screen. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that introduction, Helen, um, and thanks to all the folks who are tuning in this evening. Um, it's really a great honor to have been uh, invited to contribute work to this really materially rich and conceptually rich exhibition and to sort of have my work um, juxtaposed to that of Emily's, Philippa's and Meryl's work. So for the most part, I work in sculpture, although I do dabble um, in other fine art disciplines, which um, you'll see tonight, often with a sort of sculptural approach. And the human animal relationship riddled with uh, political, social, moral, and ethical complications in, in many ways has served as um, a catalyst to my practice. So this work, um, it's entitled Inanimate Beings, it's, and it's one of three works of mine that have been included in the Hunter Gatherer exhibition. And for this work, I draw on the historic features of iconic 17th century Flemish game painting. So in my sculptural interpretation of the genre, I alter the intrinsic identities of the animal bodies originally painted by artists such as Franz Snyder while creating another and um, it just so happens that all three works of mine that Helen selected for the Hunter Gatherer exhibition um, directly draw on the images that Snyder created. And for me, these works, they sort of summon a rethinking of the genre and by extension, um, a rethinking of the hunt. So 
Snyder's work, uh, you know, it really appeals to the senses. And for me, I've always been drawn to his really rich and uh, chaotic still life images of precariously presented fruit and wild game. Uh, pictured here, this is a detail of the hound that stands on the floor in front of the wall uh, composition that makes up inanimate beings. And there's sort of ornate uh, scrolls that flow throughout the wall piece and more subtly appear uh, to emerge from the dog's fur. So hopefully in this image, you can kind of see a bit of that detail on the, the back of the dog's neck and also in the uh, end of its, its tail. And sort of, yeah, in the mirrored compositions that I present, uh, these decorative details allude to both architectural ornamentation and the lavishly carved frames that paintings from the Baroque uh, period were displayed in. So also included in Hunter Gather, you'll find this piece, uh, which takes on a very similar form to that of inanimate beings. Uh, both of these works were originally sculpted in clay and then through a mold making process, um, I've cast them in polyurethane resin. So this is, um, this is a pair of images of uh, the work I just shared with you in progress. On the left, you can see an image during the early stages of the sculpting of the original sculpture uh, or the original sculpture in clay. And then on the right, the blue stuff, uh, this is a mold making silicone that I layer on the original sculpture uh, to create a mold so that I can re replicate the clay sculpture into a permanent material through a casting process. So the surfaces of these cast resin works, um, they've been treated with paint applied with an airbrush, uh, creating an off spray effect where the colors of one component uh, merge into the surrounding forms. And their unnatural uh, colors contrast the exquisite realistic renderings that Snyder was so famous for. In 2016 and to 17, I am, I participated in a year long studio residency at the Florence Trust in London, UK. And the residency, it took place inside of this neo-Gothic church that was built in the 1850s. And during my time at the Florence Trust, I wanted to make work that responded to my location. So naturally while I was in, in England, I really, um, I was interested in researching and learning about the deep rooted history of hunting and field sports in the UK. And so in London, I also, I had access to some of the world's most renowned museums. And I found myself using things that I saw at different historic sites or museums as a starting point for new work. Um, it was during my year in London where I really began to engage with subjects derived from the styles and motifs of fine and decorative arts from past eras. And I began to reference historic objects or images in a way where I would um, disrupt, disrupt their historical reference through a simple gesture or by manipulating them or rendering them with unexpected materials to create some sort of contemporary confrontation with those objects and to tell a new story. Uh, pictured here, this is um, a Victorian rocking horse uh, that caught my eye in the collection of the V&A uh, Museum of Childhood. So from that rocking horse uh, at the V&A, I created this work and it's titled The End of the Chase. And while working in England, I was particularly fascinated by the century old controversial and politically charged tradition of fox hunting. Um, this is an activity where huntsmen on horses um, pursue foxes with packs of hounds. Um, in, in 2014, there was a hunting act that was that passed making this hunt illegal. And so I created this work um, in response, which I hope to bring on a conversation on the dilemmas of this hunting act. So on one hand, there's sort of this importance of um, maintaining cultural traditions. And on the other hand, we find ourselves in this, um, you know, a modern world with growing concerns for ethics. So the church space um, I was creating artwork in while I was at the Florence Trust Residency, it was full of really wonderful architectural details and ornamentation. And one thing I like to do when I'm making work 
in a new place is uh, sort of interject aspects of the space into my work. Um, here on the left, you can see me making a mold of the base of a marble figure, which I integrated into the base of a pair of figures of my own that I'll share with you shortly. Um, there were also sort of ornate architectural stone carved elements in the church, um, which I molded and cast. You can see that on the top uh, right here. Um, this particular uh, sort of casting was, um, I actually integrated it into the back of the saddle of the collapsed ro rocking horse that I shared in the previous slide. So I, um, I presented the works that I created during my time uh, in London at Art Murr in Montreal uh, when I returned to Canada. And so the exhibition, I titled it Behind Elegantly Carved Wooden Doors. And I framed the exhibition as being the interior of a historic manor house where the lavish objects found inside weren't quite right and everything had a bit of a twist. Um, here you can see where I integrated the base that I molded while I was at the Florence Trust. Um, I used it to form the bases uh, for this work titled Diana and Actian. And for this work, I borrowed imagery from classical mythology of the god and goddess of the hunt to create my own version of Diana and Actian, where I represented their bodies in an aged phase of life while referencing figurative statuary. This is another installation view of the, the exhibition at Art Murr. Um, in the foreground here, you can see a trio of wooden pole toys, which I'll share with you next. So I turned the wooden toys into dead playthings to create a work that was sparked when learning about uh, driven pheasant shooting in the UK. Uh, this piece, it was titled Fair Game. In this piece titled Throne, I employ a plastic deer hunting decoy as raw material to construct an armchair that alludes to the transformation of animal bodies into objects through the practice of taxidermy. So culminating that uh, exhibition at Art Murr, I began to work uh, towards uh, my next solo exhibition, where I planned for a work that would continue to draw on the visual culture of the hunt that I explored during my time in London at the Florence Trust. And so for this work, I create a hybrid between art historical imagery from paintings of hounds hunting stags with flashy colors and synthetic materials of modern day dog chew toys. And I hope that the work would create a conversation um, or provoke questions surrounding hunting as play versus hunting as survival. So this is the uh, resulting work and it was titled Fetch. Um, it's a life-size deer uh, with two dogs or hounds. Uh, the deer's uh, surface is covered with a, a neon tennis ball felt. Its antlers are um, made out of purple nylon rope and also the seaming on the deer is a, a nylon webbing material. It's another detail or just a detail of that work. Uh, hopefully on your end, you can better see the, the texture of the, um, the felt surface. Um, I didn't mention it, but the dogs were cast in resin and their surfaces have been treated with paint. So this is a, an install image of the work at New Art Projects in London, England. Um, this exhibition, it was in the summer of 2018 um, and it then traveled uh, in 2019 showing in Berlin and in uh, Montreal with Art Murray Gallery. So this, uh, this wall work accompanied the Fetch sculpture um, and I see it as sort of an index for its reading. Um, this work, it includes a series of porcelain dog, toy, dog toys that I marked with the aristocratic hunting motifs and gold luster found on antique English pottery. 
So some of the objects in this composition have been completely made by me. Others are simply found objects that I've uh, installed on the wall. Um, and there are also a few objects that are found and altered. So these are just a few details. Um, in the bottom left, you can see this is like a, a plush dog bone toy uh, that I've um, created a plaster mold uh, for casting uh, uh, porcelain slip into and through a firing process ultimately um, resulted in this ceramic object. Then on the right, you can see a uh, few of the found objects, the tennis ball and the tennis ball dog toy, dumbbell shaped dog toy. Um, and then the white uh, object, this is a found ceramic piece that I've added a hunting motif onto and some gold luster. So when I had the opportunity to uh, represent this exhibition um, that I just previously shared with you in Montreal at Artmer, I produced a few new a few new works to accompany the original work shown. Um, this is a work. It was titled Boar Mount. And so for this work, I once again draw on the objectification of animals into ornaments and trophies. Um, this is further explored. Uh, with the hog's uh, teeth and tusks that I fashioned into brass candle holders. Um, finally, I created this work titled Carousel, uh, which is the third work of mine that's included in Hunter Gatherer. And for this work, I transform a children's paper craft into a dramatic hunting scene where a pack of hounds chase a wild boar. And again, I borrow imagery from Snyder, rendering his motifs as graphite drawings before cutting them out uh, to assemble this kinetic sculpture, sculptural work that animates the hunt. So thanks so much everyone for your attention. Um, I hope I've left you feeling intrigued and I'll now pass it back to Helen. Thanks, Nicholas. That was fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so next is uh, next is Emily Jan, and before I even introduce, actually, I'm gonna I'll, I'll ask you guys this later, um, or maybe now. Did you two know each other before this show? I think just through we've never met, but through uh, social media, right? We've been following each other's practice, I think, for a few years, and had work in shows together, or at least one that I can think of, right? Yeah, for sure. And we'll have a link to Artner, but I, yeah, I had not actually physically met until we were there for install. Yes. Amazing, like such a, a wild sort of serendipity here, uh, which will become increasingly apparent. Um, okay, so um, Emily Jan, uh, presented a, a large, uh, an amazing work in, um, in Hunter Gatherer. Uh, it's called After the Hunt, and it reimagines Franz Snyder's painting, Still Life with a Roe Deer, uh, in the form of a textile-based installation. The spoils of the hunt are assembled here in felt and found objects. A boar's head and the suspended body of a roe deer uh, are meticulously recreated juxtaposed against decaying fruit, flowers, and various tropes associated with 17th century Dutch still life. Jan critiques the imagery associated with the genre of the post-hunt tableau, each lux luxurious object functioning as a reminder of the excesses, exploitation, and violence of colonialism, as well as a reminder of the transience of existence. Uh, so to introduce Emily, uh, Emily is a Chinese American artist and writer currently based in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, her biophilic sculptures and installations combine the found with the fabricated to evoke the faraway and the fantastical. As a wanderer, naturalist, and collector of objects and stories, she is guided in her work by the spirit of exploration, kinship, and curiosity. 
Jan has recently exhibited at the Dixième Biennale uh, Nationale de Sculpture Contemporaine uh, at, in Trois-Rivières, uh, the Textile Museum of Canada in Toronto, the Robert Bateman Centre Gallery of Nature in Victoria, Gallery Art Muir in Montreal, uh, the Museo Textile de, de Oaxaca in, Montre in, sorry, in Mexico, and the Mary M. Torgler Fine Arts Centre in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, and the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba, and the DC3 Gallery in Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, she's very busy. Uh, she has participated in residencies at Artscape Gibraltar Point uh, on Toronto Island, the Elsewhere Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina, and Denali National Park in Alaska. Jan has written and illustrated three books and has contributed writing to a number of art publications. She currently teaches at McEwen University and sits on the board of directors for Union House Arts Inc. in Newfoundland, uh, as well as Carfac, Alberta. So with that, I, uh, I will invite you, Emily, to rejoin us and to share your screen and talk about your work. Hey, hi, very nice hey. to be here. <laughs> nice to see your face. <laughs> Thank you to everyone else for being here whose lovely faces I cannot see right now. Give me one second and let me get my tech happening. Okay. All right. This should give you my screen very shortly. Wonderful. Hopefully you can all see that. Helen, yell at me if you can't, because <laughs> oh, I can no good. longer see you. Okay. Perfect. So <laughs> thanks everyone for being here. Um, thank you, Helen, for including me in this exhibition. It's been such uh, an honor and really just such a delight to come out there and sell the show and to be uh, in Nicholas and Philippa and Merrill's artistic company. Um, and your team there is amazing. So thank you for all of the support. Um, I am going to start this out uh, by just giving a tiny bit of background. Let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay. So yes, my name is Emily Jan. I'm an artist and a writer. I am originally American. I was born and raised in California, um, but I moved to Montreal in 2010 to do my MFA at Concordia University, uh, which I did in the fibers and material studies uh, department. And then in 2020, in the dead winter of the first year of the pandemic, relocated to Edmonton, Alberta, drove across the country, and it was like the zombie apocalypse. So anyway, now I'm out west. Um, so in my sculpture practice, I work uh, primarily with textile materials and found objects mixed. Um, I do actually, uh, I used to do a lot of molding casting. I do a little bit less now because I'm working out of my own house, but it's funny. I didn't realize how much overlap you and I have, Nicholas. Um, but anyway, this is a very old picture of me in my old studio in Montreal with all of my stuff. Um, as you can tell, I'm a, a collector of things, um, but unlike the type of people who I think collect um, fancy things, <laughs> things that have genuine value. I'm really just drawn to junk, I think. Uh, this studio was one block from my house, which was in turn one block from the Renaissance Tripri, which is Montreal's version of uh, Goodwill. And so it was very easy to find an excuse to sort of circle through the Goodwill on my way to the studio every day. Um, and like, I think like 90% of the volume of my studio and also of my household came from, you know, these just sort of junk thrift shops. Anyway, um, before I talk about the work that I have in Hunter Gatherer specifically, I just wanted to give you a little bit of an overview of my methods and materials because it always comes up um, in questions. Uh, so this is actually also an older piece. It's a piece from 2013. It's called Ragnarok. Um, when it was actually installed, it was installed in a small dark room so that you sort of entered the room and turned around and then it was like there leaping at you. I guess it made a few people scream. Uh, but the, the most common question that I get about my work, especially uh, these sort of more animal form based things are, is it real or what of it is real? So um, I think like Nicholas, I actually do sculpt everything. And then um, some things are just directly sculpted and they become part of the piece. And then other things I sculpt and then make a mold of uh, and cast. So for instance, this detail image of the mouth of this wolf, um, everything in here is sculpted and then cast. None of it is real stuff. It's not real teeth. It's not taken off of a real skull. 
Um, the tongue, which is something else that everybody always asks about, is actually silicone over wool, something I made use to use of in um, a number of pieces. There's a different detail shot. Again, the are um, I sculpted the forms of them, and then it's cast in silicone, uh, and the claws are cast in resin. Um, the fur of most of these animal pieces uh, are is actually made out of wool. Uh, I work a lot with raw wool and with felt, um, felt that I'm making. So here are a few shots of this whole sort of wool process. Um, I don't have images of me doing the wet felting because it's too messy to <laughs> do and like photograph myself at the same time without like dropping my phone in the wet soapy mess. But uh, I wet felt the sheets and then cut and pattern the forms. Um, you know, kind of like dressmaking, uh, and then the color is applied with needle felting. So needle felting, some of you might be familiar with. Most of the time, most people use it either for surface kind of embellishment or for making smaller solid pieces that are through to the core all the way wool. Um, I don't know very many other people who use it in this, this sort of more large scale way, but over hollow forms. Um, there are a handful of people for sure. But um, again, to anticipate questions that always come up. Yes, it is very labor intensive. <laughs> yes, the pieces take a long time to finish. Um, now, days, oh, my computer's freaking out. Hopefully it's not freaking out for you. Uh, but so in this image, you can see the armature beneath the pelt. Um, where I work primarily with chair canning reed, um, otherwise known as rattan. And so um, it's something that I point out sometimes because once the pieces are covered, which often at this point they are, um, people are often not aware that they're actually fully hollow on the inside. And I've seen some extremely beautiful work made with those uh, sort of ready-made foam forms that you can buy from actual taxidermy shops that are meant for hunting trophies and mounts, um, but I've actually never used them myself. Um, I think like I said, beautiful work has been made with them. It's just, it's just not what I do. So for me, the sculptures are almost the, the underlying armature is almost kind of like a line drawing in space, like a, like a three-dimensional line drawing. And even if most of it gets covered over by the wool um, and padding eventually, it's what sort of gives the gesture and, and the, the, the line to the piece for me. Um, so I do it this way. Okay. So with that, I'm going to jump into the work that is actually at the Macintosh. And uh, those of you who are actually in this class have, have gotten to see um, the latest installation of. So this piece is called After the Hunt. Um, I initially conceived of it and, and made it between 2012 and 2014. Um, I've shown it many times since then, and each time it changes a little bit, um, as you can imagine. All of those objects are placed in situ. It's not like one giant thing that comes out of a box. So it changes a little bit each time. Um, it is a room sized installation uh, made out of found objects, fabricated objects, some living plants, some faux plants. Um, often there's real food in the show. There's a little bit less real food at, at uh, the Macintosh because it's warned about <laughs> about there being vermin in the uh, tunnels underneath your guys's campus so a little less real food this time um but yeah because of all of those elements as well it's always a little bit different so um when i first made it it was actually my graduate thesis um and so yeah started in 2012 worked on it for two years showed it for the first time in 2014 um, so it was both the last thing that I did at Concordia University in Montreal, where I did my MFA. And it was also the first sort of like large thing that went out into the world here in Canada um, for me as, as a professional artist. Um, it has traveled around. I think it's probably had like maybe nine or 10 showings, including this one. Um, I actually thought until, uh, until Helen included it in this exhibition that I might be retiring it. So it was used uh, last in 2019 in a music video for the indigenous musician, uh, Jeremy Dutcher. And we kind of reconceived the table as a setting, um, uh, basically one of the sites in this video. I can send uh, Helen the link to the video to send you guys if you guys are curious to see it later. Um, but the whole table is usually 20 feet long and four feet wide. Um, in this installation, it's 18 feet just because of the constraints of the room. But the point being that it's big and it's meant, it's designed so that your sort of first impression of it gives you that sort of 17th century Dutch still life hit. Um, but then really to sort of take it in, you've got to go in. It almost becomes a temporal piece. Like you have to go in and kind of walk along it and look at all the details. 
Um, but that was sort of my original inspiration was to, was to make it kind of almost like a painting that you could walk into because that's what I always that was my relationship to those sort of Dutch still life paintings when I would see them in museums and stuff when I was growing up as I like, oh I just they were such tantalizing spaces and everything was rendered so sort of crystal clear and so everything looked almost so touchable like I always wanted to be able to move into that space um this particular image is a documentation of its first installation in 2014 at a place called uh, Les Ateliers Jean Briand, and that was in Montreal. And what it is is, I don't even know if it exists as an exhibition space anymore, but at the time it was like a big, empty, um, drafty warehouse, uh, dark walls, and um, this sort of like beautiful, gloomy atmosphere. And it really gave this uh, like historical kind of like sepia toned vibe. Um, so of course the immediate question uh, like conceptually is for me, why this 17th century Dutch still life? Um, and there are a number of ways to answer that question, I think, but um, the thing that was, I think the most important for me and that sort of emerged out of my graduate thesis reading about this time, because I kept being drawn to it and being like, why am I drawn to it? <laughs> is that um, I came to realize that it, for me, I see this time as kind of a bookend to where we are now. Like you have the beginnings of globalization, you have galleons starting to, you know, European galleons starting to sort of cross the oceans, um, you know, invade other countries, <laughs> discover, discover new material, bring it back, new species, bring it back to Europe. And then it starts to really mix up the world in a way at a speed um, that hadn't previously happened. Although of course there were cross fertilization and travel before that. So I, I started to be unable to see it as anything other than the start of the arc, which is kind of collapsing all around us right now. Uh, so as I said, this work, it's a really a mix of fabricated objects, found objects, uh, real food and flowers, and those of course decay over time, plus the fake fruit, um, in the past, I used to do this with real beer and real wine, but those actually really do attract quite a lot of insects. So I stopped doing that at one point. Um, but the idea is that as, as you were walking around the table and sort of looking at the details that you were constantly sort of needing to question, like, is, is it real? Like, what's my relationship to this stuff? Um, and kind of in an overarching way, um, I really, I wanted the, the choice of this materials and the mixture of the made and the found. Um, to both, of course, like make a commentary on consumption on where we're at with all of that right now, you know, on the sort of runaway production um, and then all the detritus and waste that that creates. Uh, but then at the same time, there's a kind of a celebration of the object itself and of craftsman craftsmanship and of the, the inner life of things. Like everything has a trajectory, like something is made, whether it's made by hand or if it's made in a, you know, a factory and then it leaves and it goes somewhere, right? It has a life and some of things live longer than others. Other things travel farther uh, than others. Um, and that's something that I've always found interesting and might be part of what underpins my fascination for, you know, value villages and junk shops. <laughs> So um, as a rule in general, uh, in this installation, most of the animals um, I fabricated. So again, it's wool, reed, resin, silicone, um, the sort of similar process to what I showed you at the beginning. Um, but then for the objects themselves, um, I had basically one sort of primary rule. And that was that uh, none of it was sourced from quote unquote real antique stores. <laughs> Cause you know, there are plenty in Montreal just as there are plenty in out here out West, but A, I didn't have the budget to do that. But B, I also, I really didn't, I really wanted objects that had the aura of history and the aura of value, but were in fact, probably garbage. <laughs> um, so most of it was either given to me or I found in the street or, um, but the vast majority, yeah, came from either the Renaissance Repri or other sort of um, like secondhand shops like that. Um, and so, yeah, they are essentially junk. Um, the way that I put it in my thesis was, it's, this is one stop before the landfill really. And I'm pulling them out at this point. Um, uh, but what I was looking for when I was sort of scanning the aisles to, to collect the objects to go into uh, this insulation was, you know, did it have that sort of whiff, you know, from 15 feet away of believability, but, you know, when you actually look at it, it's probably a mass produced object. It's what we're surrounded with these days, of course. Um, so 
to sort of achieve all the little moments and stuff on that table, I borrowed freely uh, imagery and symbolism um, from across a lot of the genres of Dutch still life painting. Um, and probably many of you know already that, you know, there's a handful of like very recognizable tropes um, like the Venitas, um, Memento Mori uh, with the skull or the spilt glass, you know, sort of like glass half empty or one that just totally spilled out on the table. Um, one way or the other, most of them have to do with our own mortality and the idea of the passing of time. Um, and so that I think is also like something sort of hoovered into this piece as well. Um, so this is an image, for instance. So yeah, there's there's you know some of the the classic sort of reference images. Um, this is a, a installation shot uh, from Western itself. So you can see, for instance, like there's the bromer that's been tipped over and spilt. Uh, there is the um, the skull, which is actually I think the head of like some Halloween <laughs> object. Uh, it was also really fun. I, I would often go to uh, those junk stores with my studio mates who also were maybe closet hoarders. And, you know, they'd be like, what do you need today? And be like, I need the universe to provide me with one giant red lobster. Like, please, Renaissance gods, like give me one giant red lobster today. Like, give me a skull today. Um, and so it was kind of fun to approach things that way. Uh, there's another example. So like there's so many paintings that are called something like Still Life with Oysters and Lemon. Um, it's actually also the title of a little book by a poet named Mark Doty, who I, I quoted a lot in the written part of my thesis. Um, and so there are the lemons in the original version. There's also a set in uh, the version on Western campus. Because they're cut open, they're actually the first element that tends to rot and grow mold. Um, and once had the lemons go spectacularly horrible. Um, it was in it was in Hamilton, and they sp sprouted like like a legion of of um, fruit flies, and never seen anything like it before. And I was like, oh, you guys, you should have just thrown them away. And they're like, oh, we didn't want to change the work. So I created an infestation. Um, but I kind of like that this is like that transforms from something that's very fresh and appealing and inviting on the first day when I first, you know, I always cut the lemon for the vernissage and it lets its aroma into the air and then it just becomes something really totally nasty by the last day. Um, so it's funny, uh, the Franz Snyder's uh, kind of overlap between a lot of us. Um, unlike Nicholas, I feel like I don't have a particular, particular personal um, tie to this work or to his painting. Um, but I, I, and this, this painting in particular, I think just, I grabbed it because I like the composition of it, but it also had not in addition to the hunt, like a lot of the other sort of elements like the fruit basket and the flowers and things. Um, so this is the image that inspired, um, that, that, that got me moving on this installation, uh, way back when you can sort of see the resonance of certain things always end up in relatively the same positions on the table to make those, uh, to, to make that general composition, but then all of the details change. Um, just a little sidebar, interesting thing about the, uh, the flower part of the, uh, still life. Um, they are called Bloom still Leven, which is literally means flower still life, Dutch. It used to be my least favorite of this genre because it'd be like, oh yeah, another flower painting. They kind of all look the same, like yawn, whatever. Um, until I read somewhere in my research when I was uh, working on this thesis that a lot of these paintings are actually almost, you can think of them almost like little cabinets of curiosity themselves. They look like something that you know, you would just point down on the table and paint as it is, but but the point being that actually in in the 17th century, before planes, before hot house, you know, hot houses, before you know, Amazon and Uber and all, you know, everything that moves stuff around the world so fast, you could actually they're temporarily impossible. Quite a lot of them, because of the time and the place that a lot of these flowers bloom, you would never be able to actually put them all in one bouquet. So I guess artists would do drawings and sketches and renderings of flowers as they came sort of through their possession and then amalgamate them into these bouquets that actually never existed. And then replicating that, you know, in plastic, basically these silk flowers that um, they inherited from a, a show was, um, was my way of sort of handling that. So that made me like the flower still lives a lot more. Anyway, coming up on time. So I just wanted to point out one other thing, this, um, this is the element of the installation that uh, when I was minding it myself, I would find 
poked and prodded and moved around the most often. And I think they are needle felted. They are peaches. Uh, they're one of the few pieces of food on the table that I made by hand. But I think people I, like just touch them because they really want to know, like question their reality. You know what I mean? Like question what they're made out of. So they're always kind of nudged around. Um, the last thing that I will say is because of uh, doing doing this as my thesis uh, for Concordia, of course, at Concordia, you got to do a written thesis as well. And then I am just the kind of person who has to make everything 10 times more complicated than it really needed to be to begin with. So instead of writing a paper, I did a book project. So it's a 108 page book. The book is split in three sections. The, the first section is kind of like a visual riddle, a visual and verbal riddle. The middle section is 10 vignettes about 10 objects that exist on the original table. Some of them are gone now, but they were there originally. Um, and those vignettes are, you know, draw from historical and contemporary sources, but also a lot just from my own life. So they're sort of like little mini stories. And then the last section, I sort of chickened out and decided I had to put a formal essay in there after all, but it's, it's a little bit of a crankily written formal essay. Um, there's just a few pages from inside it that has uh, quite a few illustrations in it too. And I mentioned this only because I put the whole thing online. Um, I, I did a number of printed versions of it over time, um, but you can get to it also really easily from my website if you just go to emilyjan.com and it's under the, the book section if you're curious to read some of the, the other thinking behind this piece. So um, that is that, I think I will stop there. Um, Helen, I'm going to totally admit to you and everybody else on this call right now, I sort of forgot about the part where I was supposed to put in more of my work that I've worked on <laughs> since then. So if it comes up in the questions, I have my website up, like we can glance at images quickly, but I don't want to take any more time now because I already structured this this way. So I hope you'll forgive me for that. <laughs> Oh, it's totally fine. Uh, okay. I, I really feel like there's so much going on in this work that it is enough. <laughs> I mean, talking about your, your practice widely is, um, you know, it's certainly not mandatory. Um, oh, and can you finish the screen sharing? Yes, I'm trying to just <laughs> get over there so I can turn it off. There okay, we there we go. Is Perfect. Off? Great. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's so fascinating. Like it's so dense, right? Like there's so much, there's so much going on in that work. So, I mean, you know, even in with this sort of short period of time that you have, it's uh, yeah, totally understandable if you're not sort of contextualizing it in like, you know, the grand scheme of your other totally super dense work. <laughs> so it's, uh, no, it's totally fine. Um, okay, so now we are going to move on to Philippa Jones's work. Uh, so for this exhibition, um, I have included three monumental drawings of moose necropsies, uh, which disrupt the notion of the grotesque by revealing the beauty previously hidden below the surface of the skin. Now I can tell you that of all of the work that I included in this exhibition, these three drawings, I was, I was actually nervous about including, but um, turns out I didn't need to be worried about it. Anyway, so these drawings are exquisite depictions of the aftermath of a moose hunt in Newfoundland, uh, an event that reminds us of the interrelationship of death, consumption, and sustenance. Created in an attempt to come to terms with the death of a close friend, uh, one of the drawings also subtly references Caravaggio's Incredulity of St. Thomas, uh, where fingers delicately probe flesh, seeking explanations and solace in the bodies of the dead. Uh, Philippa Jones has been living in pract and practicing in St. John's, Newfoundland since immigrating from the United Kingdom over a decade ago. She is a mother, visual artist, and executive director of Eastern Edge Gallery. Central to Jones's work is the exploration of constructed realities, uh, our relationship to mortality and time, active myth-making, wonder, and the inquisitive mind. Jones completed a BFA and an MFA at Falmouth University in the UK. Jones's diverse practice includes sculpture, drawing, painting, stop motion animation, art games, and interactive installations. She is exhibited at major public galleries, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Rooms Provincial Art Gallery, Beaverbrook Art Gallery, Two Rivers Gallery in BC, and the Confederation Center in PEI. 
Uh, in 2012, Jones was the recipient of the Vanel Carfac Excellence in Visual Arts Emerging Artist of the Award, uh, Emerging Artist Award, and in uh, 2019, she won the Milestone Award. Jones was longlisted for the Sobe Art Award in 2019, and in 2020 was shortlisted for the Arts NL Artist of the Year. And this year, Philippa won the, <laughs> the Arts NL Artist of the Year Award. So, congratulations on the recent accolade, Philippa. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to you and feel free to share your screen and um, I'm looking forward to hearing about this. Hey, thanks so much, Helen. Um, right. Let's hope this works. <laughs> hey, I shall just <clears throat> start the slideshow. Can everyone see that okay? Helen's nodding. Okay. <laughs> right. So I'm going to uh, kind of give you an overview of my interests and uh, kind of what led up to the creation of this work. And also, um, uh, I guess, a little bit of my relationship with mortality and death. Um, this work. Oh. Okay, yeah, so there will be, uh, as Helen was concerned about the large moose drawings, um, I want to just give everyone a heads up that there will be images like that in this slideshow. There won't be anything um, photographed, there'll just be uh, the, the drawings that I've done. So if you're okay with those, you should be okay with whatever I've put in this slideshow. Um, so the my use of animals uh, in my work um, really comes down uh, to the fact that uh, I'm trying to give people a sense of uh, death and mortality in a way that's more palatable to them. And having images of human beings dead on the table would probably cause greater aversion and people would look away and not want to uh, think about it or let themselves ponder it or consider it um, for themselves in their own lives. Uh, death is something that um, on the one hand, we're shielded from in contemporary culture a lot. On the other, uh, we're also um, in some ways shocked by it as children. So these are two stills from um, animations that really had an impact on me as a kid. So one is Watership Down. Um, the, not really a story that is child appropriate. Um, there's um, a point in the movie where there's literally, um, and in the book too, where there's uh, rivers of, of blood like going down across the fields and it's pretty nightmare inducing for children. There's also like the death of Bambi's mother um, as another kind of nightmarish moment where children are confronted with death. <clears throat> and so animals are usually the, um, the ways in which we are introduced to death. I uh, myself as a kid had um, many pets, all that met, uh, all that died and usually in tragic kind of darkly hilarious ways. Can I say that? Um, <laughs> but they, uh, I had um, a rabbit that I loved dearly one day found its guts all over the inside of the cage after a fox had been through, um, had ducklings that I raised into ducks that would follow me around the garden. And uh, one day came out to the pond that had frozen over and the ducks hadn't gone back in their house overnight. And a fox had walked across the pond and then just snacked on the ducks that were frozen in place uh, by their legs and just left their little leg stumps uh, behind. So pretty dark. Um, and uh, not like the um, the nice cute idea we have of pets. Like, wouldn't it be lovely for kids to have a cute little fl fluffy friend? Actually, they're kind of our introduction into broader ideas of death and our immortality. Um, I was also raised a Catholic. Uh, I am the uh, person in the blue dress kind of at the front with clenched arms at my, this is um, my confirmation, looking extremely tense about it all. Um, 
And so I was raised uh, both with like imageries of death, like the, the crucifix with Christ on the cross. Um, it's a very graphic image, uh, which is something, it's uh, both graphic, but also just every day, if you're Catholic, you see it everywhere you go. It's the symbol of your religion. And so um, death itself was something that was always very present. Um, I, uh, I, however, like from a very young age, didn't really believe in any of the teachings of Catholicism, found, had a really hard time um, getting on board with the faith that I was raised in. And um, I didn't believe in, in, in an interventionist God, but I also um, didn't believe in the assurances that came with uh, religion and Christianity and the, their classic idea of an afterlife of heaven and hell. Um, and so without that faith, I then also had a lot of questions and I considered a lot what uh, my mortality meant to me and what would happen when I died. Um, and when you direct, when anyone tries to think about uh, themselves dying, it's an extremely difficult thing to do, um, partly because we can't imagine what it is to cease to be conscious. Uh, to imagine forever without our consciousness, like uh, conceiving of it, and um, and to imagine not being able to imagine anything ever again. Um, when I went to art school, I worked in a hospice, and I uh, found that there was a real disconnect between. Um, my understanding of death as we um, experience it uh, in popular culture um, and in media and the reality of dying, which is the, the dying part is very separated and hidden. And I came across this artwork by Hannah Wilker. This is uh, Hannah when she's um, younger in her feminist uh, performance art days. And then she did a series um, uh, where she took photographs of herself when she was dying from lymphoma. And this is her last work, which was published uh, posthumously. And it just, uh, I found it both shocking, but also um, reassuring in some ways because it reflected what I was actually experiencing when I worked in the hospice. So I would go in, uh, every day and I was the housekeeper. So I would cook and clean for the patients uh, who were there and would witness and see their deaths um, during that time and felt like there was really nothing in, yeah, in my life that could help me to understand um, that, part, that significant part of the end of our lives, which um, if you're not really, religious or you have like moved away from your religion you no longer have like a framework of understanding for it so I guess I was looking for that framework but I also feel like and felt then very much like um the the act of death has been taken away from us it's been sanitized by capitalism we uh people used to have their um deceased loved ones back in the house with them they would clean the bodies themselves they would um, look after the dead and prepare them um, for burial or whatever the next stage would be. And we kind of outsource that now. Um, we very rarely ever see a dead body. We certainly don't handle them ourselves. Uh, and it's just another way in which death has become um, separated from us. And, uh, and I feel like its separation is emblematic of our um, disconnect from nature. So it's uh, on the one hand, there's the personal journey with trying to understand our own mortality and me trying to understand my own mortality. But I think it uh, speaks to a bigger concern of our, our disconnect from nature and uh, primarily because we see in nature um, 
the act of death and dying and it scares us because it's not something that we um, are confronting in culture at the moment. Um, so in my own work, uh, I have played around with ideas of time and death quite a lot. This is a, um, a series of small um, paintings I did and it's hard to tell because this is a 2D image, but um, each of the um, paintings was done built up in layers. So I'd paint a layer, then I'd add a layer of resin, then I'd paint another layer, then I'd add another layer of resin. So they almost become 3D and entombed within the resin themselves. The, the paintings kind of build up layer by layer. And uh, this was part of um, a body of work where I was looking, uh, I'd kind of created an imaginary world where in an imaginary journal where someone had traveled to an island where um, the properties of time uh, were no longer linear. And they came across this like weird cave and found all these like creatures frozen in time. So that's what this one was about. And I started sculpting. Um, this is a hair's breath in time. It's a, um, a ceramic sculpture of a hair and then uh, I cast, made a cast of that sculpture and had like a clear resin version of it kind of one step forward. Um, so it's, uh, I felt too like using the clear resin was like, um, a, and it's crystalline kind of properties, um, kind of was reminiscent of like time crystals, um, that kind of uh, sci-fi-ish kind of, thinking about time um, but when you try and and convey time in a static sculpture um, I don't know sometimes you have to reach for the sci-fi things um, and so I uh, look in a lot of my imagery I would look at um, having things both dead and alive at once that moment where um, something alive becomes something dead uh, the idea that in that moment it's the most alive it's ever been. Um, I did this, I created this uh, interactive animation. Uh, I um, drew each of these birds. This is kind of a, a condensed version of it. So you can see it from beginning to end. It starts with a dead bird um, that's lying in front of you on the floor. And as you move away, the bird kind of resuscitates. Oh, sorry, as you stand there, the bird resuscitates and awakens in your presence. But if you move away, it goes back down to death. So it's a very simple, in some ways, it's a very simple piece because it is really just um, uh, a video played from beginning to end. But it kind of goes back and forth between uh, the first still and the last still, depending on the presence of the viewer. And what I was trying to do was um, give you the power of life over this little bird and play with the ideas of, um, of life in art. So when you create a thing in art, you're giving it life. Um, and then what is it to create something that is dead uh, or an imagery that is dead? Um, you can also, I would also exhibit all the stills together. You can see uh, from this kind of, um, still this slide here, there's both the animation, uh, which you can stand in front of, and uh, also the, um, each of the stills put on the wall. So you can see them in their kind of immensity um, from beginning to end. Um, and so uh, as I was kind of playing around with these ideas of death and making other work um, that was kind of more fanciful, I guess. My best friend, as uh, Helen mentioned, my best friend died within six months of a terminal cancer diagnosis. And she'd been so present, alive and vital and filled with energy um, that I found it really hard to reconcile that she was no longer there, that she was no longer alive. Like on the one hand, I totally understood her death. I knew it. Um, on the other hand, uh, there's parts of your being and your brain that just still cannot comprehend that change, that significant change in, in your reality. Um, and 
I looked a lot at um, uh, different scientific ideas, uh, ideas to do with the law of conservation of energy, um, basically that uh, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Um, it can only be transformed. Uh, I also looked at the ideas of the infinite, um, trying to understand um, like if uh, trying to understand and comprehend that uh, if I believe that time is infinite, which I do, then what does death really mean on that like uh, infinite trajectory? Um, there's this idea that uh, it's only ourselves as people who experience time in a linear fashion because that's all we're capable of experiencing. And on the moment of our death, all space and time becomes open to us and available to us. And so that moment no longer becomes significant and an, an end is no longer an end. Um, and I would kind of allow my brain to think about all of these things and contemplate these things while I then made large bodies of work as like an act of um, ritual, as an act of immersion, uh, a space in which my brain could just kind of flow and move. Um, I've got a sticker still life in here as a uh, homage to Emily and Nicholas. Uh, so here we all are with our dead bunnies. And um, uh, you, I've put these two up here because um, I really like how uh, that we can see now in con slightly more contemporary art than 1675, that you can take like the still life um, as a discipline and the Sam Taylor Wood, like with the newer technology, you can show um, uh, not just the, the still life and the death part, but you can show the, the progress and the deconstruction and the moment in which things dissolve. Um, for some reason, oh there. Okay, so in my own work, I work in lots of different mediums. Um, these are some uh, dead hairs that I made and I wanted to make them kind of in the throes of their death. So they're literally in the moment in which um, you're not sure if they're alive or dead is their heartbeat just stopped this second. Um, and the, the resin within these works and the light within these works is almost like a, um, both a visualization of time, but also perhaps the moment of impact and rupture. Um, thinking about things like, what is it that animates us? Are we just material? Um, uh, and so as I was working on these, I was also in parallel exploring other ideas uh, around uh, mortality and grief, uh, whatever in whatever form or discipline or medium um, that kind of feels the most intuitive uh, to conveying those ideas. So um, drawing is a medium that I return to time and time again. Um, it, um, I find it to be uh, the most intuitive and ref reflective of my thoughts in the moment. Um, because it is such a quick medium and can be such an expressive one. Um, and so I started exploring these uh, drawings and yeah, so this is the, the dead hairs kind of uh, resonating back um, to art history and studies of death in art. And um, I also did this, extremely large 35 foot long drawing of a pile of dead birds and so I was kind of in my own grief exploring really tedious and repetitive work and was drawn to that because I had all these thoughts going around in my head I didn't have any answers to them I don't have any answers to them um, but I wanted to give myself space to to think and to let my mind flow in that place between thoughts um, and when your mind is free and goes to that place between thoughts, uh, is that all also a space for the unconscious? Is that a space 
uh, if there's ever a space closest to the creative space, closest to the death space, maybe that space of um, that flow space is it. And so I gave myself the space to grieve and to make. And so this um, was a pile of dead birds. I made the pile be uh, over eight feet foot high. So in the gallery, when you looked up at it, um, it was it towered above you. And then the birds start to come to life at the top and eventually fly off and away and up the wall until they're kind of the paper itself is rolled as though it could go on infinitely. Um, I also started casting organic matter in resin orbs. Um, I would kind of like um, you'd find the mosquitoes in resin from the Jurassic period. Um, I love that idea of uh, something being uh, preserved throughout time. And so I started just collecting and foraging and gathering all of these uh, different interest or, or organic things that are of interest to me and um, casting them inside, inside of resin orbs. And I made thousands of them. Uh, initially, I didn't know what my plan was. Um, and there's certainly uh, part of my own issue is that I find it hard to separate the volume of labor from a validation of my own work. Um, so if something is not complicated enough, I kind of feel like a fraud. So I can't help but just make and make and make and make. Um, I don't necessarily think that's healthy, <laughs> but that is part of what I do. Um, and so you can see like, this is uh, some of the skulls I had uh, and bits of bones that are in the orbs. I also um, started listing in my, in my uh, studio, some of the things I was putting in there. Um, if I knew what it was called, because sometimes I was just gathering random plants that I would find on hikes and not necessarily even know what those plants were named. Um, and so the, the preservation of the organic matter in these orbs acts as both um, a way to, to preserve it forever, but then it also makes it forever dead. And um, and so it has that tension in it where it's beautiful. It almost feels like new life could come from it. They almost look like eggs. And yet actually they they have taken what is organic and natural out of the life cycle. They've plasticized them and then uh, they've become eternal, but eternally separate and eternally lost and eternally suspended. Um, and so I hung all these orbs together uh, and I called this piece suspended where the open flow of natural life has been arrested and closed down into a moment of suspended dead time and then you lie at the center um, kind of like a mini death and all time is open to you. Uh, this is, you can see the view of the um, installation itself and then the looking up into the orbs. Um, it was kind of just, I didn't anticipate this fully. Um, I thought maybe it would, it would look like this, but the, because the benches that I made um, were narrow and long, you kind of had to lie stiffly upon them and people did lie on them like like they were the stone effigies on top of tombs and so you would walk into the the um the gallery and kind of be shocked and at first think you were looking at a coffin and then realize it was someone actually lying there looking up at the orbs themselves um so i kind of loved that extra layer to the piece um also the use of the gold um I purposely put it on so that it would uh, not stay stuck down fully, but kind of start coming off on people. Uh, you could tell someone had been in my show because I'd have a little dusting of gold leaf on them, but also it wore away and started to wear into the imprint of all the bodies that had laid there. Um, and then also while you were lying there, um, uh, it was reminiscent of um, the sort of icons of the saints, of the halo saints. Um, 
And so, um, as Helen mentioned before, this painting is kind of the antithesis of how I felt and was feeling about death and my own grief. Um, while uh, none of us mortals are, are ever gonna rise again um, in the face of a loved one dying, uh, even if we logically know it, we remain incredulous that they can really truly be dead. Um, and so without religion and the church, where can we go to consider our grief, our mortality, um, a space for contemplation that connects us to the wonder and the cycle of life? So that is what I really was aiming to do. Um, and so a friend of mine, so the suspended piece was great. It was beautiful. I loved it. I loved everyone's response to it, um, how immersed people were in it, how interactive it is, how it really uh, helps people to consider death in a way that, and their own mortality in a way that is uplifting. Um, but I also felt like I, I really needed to get my hands into death in, and I really needed to uh, experience it in a different kind of way too and, and, and have that as part of this body of work. And a friend of mine, uh, was the veterinary um, pathologist for the province and she allowed me to come and witness some of her necropsies of um, of animals so um, these ones are from uh, a goat necropsy that I have up on the screen here um, and what I was interested in is the beauty on the inside of the body so we um, uh, and and I wanted to uh, show that beauty, but also how ephemeral it is, and um, and I guess how delicate too. And if I kind of wanted to show you a photo of the necropsy itself because it is gruesome, and what the painting has allowed me to do, uh, because some of the photos I took could could be artworks in their own right and could be shown in their own right, but they are so graphic that what they would do was would be to separate um, the viewer from um, my end goal, which is to captivate you so that you may look upon it first and 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 wonder whether, like maybe even look away, uh, but you will return and want to look at it again. And the painting has allowed me to be extremely detailed in the work they're almost like scientific illustrations. Um, and I've included like veins and viscera and um, different like kind of regulatory systems. That, like it's it's kind of drawn in there um, as a study, but it's also made it somewhat jewel-like and um, there's a beauty to it, I think, that makes you want to keep looking again. And so on the left is the whole body of the goat. Um, once it's kind of, it's been opened up. And the fascinating thing about following a necropsy too, is that you're looking at someone, um, she's, she was trying to understand what had killed these animals. Um, and I'm there trying to understand what is death. And uh, she's telling me about like the life that the animals had by looking at its body. Um, what then has killed it uh, and caused it to eventually die um, and she's kind of exploring each part of the body to understand that and uh, here I am uh, drawing each part of the body to understand it um, and so this is my setup for my drawing I would flip from putting them on the wall to then having to lay them flat as their watercolors, like the water would pool if I was painting them upright, but they're also so big, they're like nine foot long, um, that it's extremely difficult to have the reach to draw on them flat all the time. So I would kind of switch them back and forth uh, from the table to the wall, from the table to the wall. And here you can see them in the gallery as they're exhibited now. Um, this is them in order. So it starts off with, uh, if we go from left to right, um, I, I really like that in 
this exhibition of them, they are in the round and surrounding you. So you get to experience them on all sides. Um, if we consider it like a, a linear uh, triptych, then this would be the first one, um, which is sequentially the beginning to where the whole moose, whole dead moose is being brought in. Um, and I just really love the tension of um, it hung on those chains and uh, the size of the vet who is there um, trying to shift the weight of this animal. And then uh, she kind of had to get right up in there to crack its chest and to get into, um, into the moose and kind of going back to uh, where I've referenced before my Catholic upbringing, that imagery is always present. The imagery of Catholicism often comes back through into my work, whether I'm a practicing Catholic or not, I culturally am um, and will remain one because I was brought up that way. And so the uh, to me, this looks like a crucified uh, moose almost. Um, I certainly think that it, yeah, it's reminiscent of that. Um, but also like, here is this person who is digging into this animal trying to understand its death and here am I the artist trying to understand the nature of mortality and I really like love that um that conversation that it has and so there are her hands digging in and the like uh you can feel the weight of the flesh on it um and then third uh piece is then the the a contemplation more of the dissolution then of the body like there's it's been gutted it's um just the carcass i guess and uh you can't convey the whole of the rotting in one image but this was kind of my attempt at a uh, kind of the idea of the ephemeral and the next thing um and then these these shards kind of uh, reflecting back in the dead hairs and the ceramics. And so after this body of work was made, I exhibited the suspended work in Bonavista in a, a funeral chapel, which was kind of a perfect place to do it. Um, I created, this was a slightly different variation. I created a pool, um, built a stage and put a pool of water in there and made orbs that would float and you could it sit around the edge and contemplate life and death while your feet were cool and you could pick up the orbs and have a look at what each one contained um and look at through them to the altar i did cover the altar with uh, a 12 foot drawing of uh composted plants that then um kind of climb up the wall until they start growing and I think that this iteration of the work and then this, these newer drawings are moving more towards like if I'm considering um, thinking about life in a more and death in a more holistic way and not just a binary there is life there is death but um, uh, more of a cyclical idea then this is then the next stage of the cycle which is from death then life so it's kind of starting to think of that and move into that and um, I love how the work itself fit uh, perfectly over the cross behind the altar and actually uh, it felt like it belonged there and kind of took away the religious connotations of the space while still honoring the um, honoring that it was a space of contemplation uh, and um, a, a place to honor those who had passed and so I think that's it. I hope I didn't go on too long. I guess I did. Sorry. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Granted, while you've been talking, I've been getting weather advisories. <laughs> no. I, I'm in my office. I don't even know how I'm getting home. <laughs> yeah, potential damage to like life and property. I don't even know. <laughs> anyway, I'll get home somehow. <laughs> um, so on that digressive note, now uh, we're going to look at Meryl McMaster's work. Um, 
So let's see, how am I going to do this? Since Meryl is not even here, we're going to be sort of standing in. Um, I'll be standing in for her. Uh, so um, even though Meryl isn't here, she is here with us in spirit. Well, actually, she's at her opening reception somewhere. So I hope she's having a really awesome time. Uh, but we're going to talk about her work anyway in her absence. So like, I really want to... Um, introduce her a little bit before we watch the video. Um, so first, I'm just going to talk very, very briefly about the work, and then I'm going to get Abby to share the PowerPoint. But yeah, first I'll just mention the work, and then I'll read her bio, and then Abby can share the PowerPoint. Five very, very short slides. We'll just look at them, and then we'll watch um, a 10-minute video. So uh, Merrill has created three multimedia works in response to the 19th century bell jars uh, containing taxidermied birds that are held in the collection of the McCord Museum in Montreal. Uh, combining photography, video, and sculpture, McMaster uh, questions the desire to capture and preserve animal specimens in an attempt to freeze their bodies in time. Furthermore, she draws parallels between this mode of representing animal specimens to uh, the way in which indigenous people have historically been, been portrayed in ethnographic and natural history museums. So Merrill is a Canadian artist with Plains Cree, British and Dutch ancestry. Uh, she earned her BFA in photography from the Ontario College of Art and Design um, and is currently based in Quebec. Uh, known for her large format self-portraits that have a distinct uh, performative quality, she explores questions of self through land, lineage, history and culture with specific reference to her mixed ancestry. Uh, McMaster's work has been the subject of solo exhibitions at Urban Shaman in Winnipeg, uh, the McCord Museum in Montreal, Canada House in London, UK, uh, Icon Gallery in Birmingham, in Birmingham, UK, the Image Centre in Toronto, the Glenbow Museum in Calgary, uh, the Rooms Provincial Art Gallery in St. John's. She's been shown at Memento Biennale uh, in Montreal the Museum of Contemporary Native Arts in Santa Fe, and that uh, the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian in New York, so among many others. Uh, between 2016 and 2020, her solo exhibition Confluence traveled to nine cities in Canada. Uh, she's been shortlisted for the Rencontre d'Arles New Discovery Award in 2019. She was longlisted for the 2016 Sobe Art Award, and she is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Scotiabank New Generation Photography Award, Reveal Indigenous Art Award, Charles Pachter Prize for Emerging Artists, Canon Canada Prize, Idle Yorg uh, Contemporary Art Fellowship, and the OCAD U Medal. Her work has been collected by significant uh, Canadian institutions, including the Art Gallery of Ontario, Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, and the National Gallery of Canada. So um, the slides that we're about to show you are works that she created while she was an artist in residence at the McCord Museum in Montreal. Uh, and um, while she was there to promote that exhibition, the McCord made a, a really super video uh, featuring Merrill and two of the curators there. And they were kind enough to share the video with us um, since Merrill couldn't be here for the panel discussion tonight. So it's only 10 minutes long. It's bilingual um, um, and is subtitled. Um, and it's it's fantastic, and it really it really sums up um, the work that she did for that residency and the work that is included in this exhibition incredibly well. So, Abby, could you share your screen? Okay, fantastic. So we'll just look through these very very quickly. So this is a, an installation view um, of the three works that Merrill created uh, while she was at the McCord, um, and here they are. You know. At Macintosh. Um, Abby, can you show the next slide? So um, in the foreground here, there was a work called uh, For the Song That Is to Follow, and it's an eight-hour video projection with a taxidermy starling in the center. Uh, next slide, please. This is The Feather That Tomorrow Will Form from 2001. Uh, it's a mixed media sculptural work with a sound recording. And uh, forgive me if it feels like I'm just kind of racing through. She does actually um, talk further about the work in the video and there's imagery, but I wanted everybody to have sort of some imagery to kind of grasp onto before the video, just in case you haven't been to the Macintosh to see the show. Uh, next slide, please, Abby. 
Uh, so here we have two details uh, showing the taxidermy that is included in uh, two of the works, the feather that tomorrow will form on the left and for the song that is to follow uh, on the right. And finally, I think there's one more slide, Abby. Yes, so here we have a photographic work that is more, um, it's kind of more the kind of work that Merrill is known for. It's called When the Storm Ends, I Will Finish My Work. Um, and then the sculpture work is, is quite, it's quite unusual for, for Merrill when, uh, when we think about the work that, uh, that she's been showing so uh, prolifically across, across Canada and North America and Europe. Um, okay, so now we'll just launch into the video. So Josh, can you share the video? It's like, I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I'm just talking and everybody's like putting up the media. Fantastic. Je suis absolument fascinée par les objets que Meryl a choisi dans la collection. When I first toured the McCord Museum collection, I came across a group of four bell jars. Uh, three were in the form of a bell, and one was in the shape of a glass cabinet that was used for a fire screen. And what drew me to these objects um, were they displayed scenes of exotic um, birds and, and butterflies frozen in mid-flight. And, and insects and, and dried plant material. And they made me start to think about uh, the human desire to control the natural world and to freeze it in time. Quand je regarde euh, l'œuvre de Merrill et euh, son utilisation des cloches, je ne peux pas m'empêcher de faire un lien avec la culture autochtone, la culture matérielle autochtone qu'on a voulu, à une certaine époque, figer dans le temps un peu de la même façon qu'on le fait pour les oiseaux ou pour des éléments de la nature qu'on a mis sous cloche, sous une cloche de verre. I wonder why we have this need to control nature and to bottle it up. And this made me think about how we have this troubled relationship or connection with nature and history. The works in this exhibition all relate uh, in some way to this idea. Les objets que Meryl a trouvés dans la collection sont fascinants parce qu'ils nous exposent à, 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 une, à une double comportement humain qui est assez incompréhensible, c'est-à-dire celui de vouloir mettre sous verre des oiseaux qu'on admire, qu'on aime euh, dans leur vol libre et dans leur chant euh, complètement euh, spontané. À une certaine époque, et, et pendant longtemps, on a véhiculé l'idée que les cultures autochtones étaient appelées à disparaître. On les pensait inadaptées à, aux notions de progrès. Et dans cet esprit-là, on a voulu aussi euh, préserver les traces de ces cultures-là. Puisqu'on a imaginé qu'ils allaient disparaître, il y a eu véritablement une entreprise de sauvegarde. On se rend dans les communautés autochtones et on collecte littéralement leur culture matérielle comme étant des reliques de cultures qui sont appelées à disparaître. Et ce phénomène-là a nécessairement contribué à figer dans le temps les cultures autochtones. Ce que je veux dire par là, c'est que les objets ayant été sortis de leur contexte, ayant été placés dans des entrepôts ou dans des voûtes de musées, nécessairement, elles ont, ils ont cessé d'être utilisés. Plusieurs de ces collections-là euh, ont été constituées au 19e siècle et ont été euh, mises dans des collections d'histoire naturelle parce que l'Autochtone fait partie de la nature. Donc, il ne fait pas partie de, de, bien, de la culture actuelle, il ne fait pas partie du monde actuel et les tissus du passé. On part d'objets de la collection et qui, avaient, qui étaient à la mode au 19e siècle, bon, et qui ont, sont devenus presque des, un objet banal dans une collection, mais elle nous met en face de quelque chose de, 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 de la nature humaine et puis de philosophique qui nous amène dans une réflexion très profonde dans notre rapport à la nature et puis le rapport à nous-mêmes aussi. All the works in the exhibition reference the connection that I feel to nature and to history. They also reference the feelings that I get when I think about how we try to control nature instead of trying to live within it. I think a lot of ways the works speak to my anxieties about the modern world, which I think are shared with many other people. Cette dualité qu'elle nous euh, présente à travers ces objets-là, je la retrouve dans toute l'exposition. Je la retrouve euh, 
dans la photographie, justement, où elle va nous montrer une chandelle allumée, une chandelle éteinte. Elle nous montre quelqu'un qui a énormément travaillé, et puis là, tout d'un coup, qui est fatigué, qui doit se reposer. Photograph that I created shows this weary character caught up in this dream state and working hard to record the natural history of the world while she is surrounded by this different world that is artificially engineered. Cette dualité là se retrouve aussi euh, dans le corbeau qui a deux têtes qu'on peut interpréter comme étant les présages positifs, les bons et les mauvais présages. I used uh, the two-headed crow to show the effect of industrialization on the bird, which I always use as messengers or guides in my images. And I've uh, also attached um, a small bell that the, the bird is holding in its beak. The sculpture is partly uh, about reflecting back to us our reality from new perspectives. It is also doing this to distract us as it tries to protect what uh, is contained within. Cette dualité là se retrouve aussi dans la la sculpture où euh, on a un oiseau mort, mais il est entouré de de la du, du chant des oiseaux, du cri des oiseaux qui qui veulent s'échapper, qui sont euh, éminemment vivants. Alors encore là, il y a euh, deux éléments en opposition. The video piece is about love and fear of loss, and it's also about life and death or reality and fiction. The digital murmuration is full of life and energy as it uh, dances endlessly around uh, this dead starling. The digital birds in the video piece also reference my fears about how the digital world um, can seem more alive and real than reality. Cette photographie euh, qui est dans l'installation, que Meryl a créée pour l'installation, m'interpelle beaucoup par, par son côté extrêmement poétique. Meryl nous a habitués à ses autoportraits performatifs, c'est-à-dire où elle, se, elle, elle, elle a des accessoires, elle se costume, mais elle est dans la nature et c'est quand même un contexte qui est naturel. Là, dans cette photographie, tout est artificiel, à commencer par le fond. Elle est dans un univers bleu, euh, qui, à prime abord, ressemble à un ciel de, un peu un ciel de tempête, comme l'évoque le titre d'ailleurs, parce qu'il y a beaucoup, beaucoup d'objets qui semblent aller dans tous les sens. Mais moi, je vois une référence directe au travail de la photographe Anna Atkins au 19e siècle en Grande-Bretagne. Elle était fascinée par les algues. Elle voulait faire un inventaire, un atlas des algues qu'on trouve sur le littoral britannique. Elle les faisait des impressions de ces algues sur du papier traité au cyanure, ce qu'on appelle des cyanotypes. Et sa façon de procéder, c'était par photogramme, c'est-à-dire qu'on met, on applique l'algue sur le papier et on l'expose à la lumière et tout ce qui reste euh, en, par la suite, c'est le, le contour de l'objet. I used the cyanotype process to create an artificial globe that the character is surrounded by. This took a lot of uh, experimentation. I worked indoors in a controlled environment, and I experimented with light sources that were operating at different wavelengths, and I mounted them uh, at different heights, and then had to do a very long exposure um, to, to get the desired effect that, uh, that you see. And I also had to play with the, the pH of the water um, to get uh, the deepness of blue. Depuis le 16e siècle, en France, en Europe, on connaît les, les, les cabinets de curiosité, euh, les objets autochtones euh, qui sont extrêmement riches, extrêmement raffinés, extrêmement beaux, esthétiquement, se retrouvent à côté des éléments de l'histoire naturelle dans les cabinets de curiosité du roi. En mettant sous verre ces cultures-là, en les figeant dans le temps, eh bien, on, on contribue à, ce, à cette image-là de société autochtone non adaptée au présent. Ce qui est trompeur, ce qui est faux, on le sait, ce n'est pas vrai. Les cultures autochtones ont toujours continué d'évoluer. C'est seulement qu'elles ont été invisibilisées, elles ont été mises au rencard de la société. Donc, on n'a pas vu ces développements-là, on n'a pas vu cette continuité-là, alors que les richesses des cultures autochtones sont manifestes. Et il y a véritablement une continuité dans ces aspects-là dans ces aspects -là matériels de leur culture. Museums collect collected objects during times when it was forbidden to practice indigenous culture. Collections are to me a reminder of the disappearance of our language and culture. One of the lessons that I've been taught by elders is the return to traditional knowledge, 
which involves seeing nature as going on forever and that we are part of it. Nature works in cycles that repeat and continue. The exhibition in many ways is about this lesson. The works show efforts to control nature and prevent time from passing by. Instead, I think we should look for knowledge in the world around us and accept our role in the passing of time. Okay, um, can I invite all the artists to turn their cameras back on? And I'm going to have a look in the Q&A to see if we have any questions. Um, we don't have any questions in the q and I'm hoping that people will perhaps put some in. I'm going to check the chat to see if there are any questions in there. We have various, we have many comments. Um, but I'll see if there's any questions in here. And in the meantime, other people um, in the audience do feel free to ask some questions. Um, actually, no, I know I have a I have a, a quick question um, while I'm looking and waiting to see if other ones come in. Uh, so I'm thinking there's a lot of students who are in the audience tonight. Uh, some of them will be studio majors, not all of them. But I would like to know, um, you know, there's so much research that informs all of your work. And I'm thinking that there are a lot of students, um, you know, they're they're really in the very, very beginning stages of their practices. So maybe you could talk a little bit, just uh, just briefly. I do see we have one question. Um, just talk a little bit maybe um, about like the value of research um, in informing your practices. You can take that in whatever order you want. I'm not going to assign it to anybody. I'll just start by saying that um... Like for me, uh, the research often starts with, um, you know, seeing something or learning uh, a small tidbit of information about something and that leading to kind of, um, you know, learning about something else and, and sort of one thing leads to the next. And, um, and that's sort of, I think, maybe where the starting point for some of my work begins. Yeah, I feel that too. And I'm glad that you said it because sometimes I feel like, oh, this is such a thin thread of something and I don't know why I'm following it. But I think if there's anything that I've learned in the, I don't know, what year is it? Like <laughs> however many years it's been since I graduated, like eight, nine years, but just um, to trust those instincts. And I think it's a thing that we say to our students and it's like easy to say, but very difficult to do, right? And like somewhere in there, there's there's a thread. And if you follow it for long enough, it will come to light what it is that's underneath. Like just struck listening to both of you talk to like how much and to, to Meryl's video as well, like how many overlaps, like not just the obvious sort of aesthetic overlaps, but like the time and the mortality and just, yeah, there's so much that's in there that runs through all of it. Is Helen's the best? Is Helen's good at her job? <laughs> I'll shut I think, up now. Yeah, I mean, I did, I planned that actually, like, you know, to a fairly large degree, actually, not everything. I mean, the whole Fran Snyder's thing between the two of you, I, I did not know, I did not realize it was so like heavy in Nicholas's work as well. Like I knew it was in yours, Emily, but I, I, I mean, I had a studio visit with Nicholas and I don't like, I don't remember you talking specifically about that. So like tonight it's like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is like, right. the resonance is, um, it's just so, uh, it's so much, right? It's incredible. I was thinking um, when I was preparing for this talk, it actually hit me that the three works that you had selected uh, really directly drew on the Fran Snyder sort of images, which isn't, you know, something that every artwork I make um, doesn't reference Fran Snyder. It's just sort of, I guess it was your, uh, yeah, you sort of <laughs> those those works. So, you know. I mean, you know, when I was choosing the work, I, you know, I, I do like to, to program work that, you know, sort of speaks to one another. I do like the kind of conversations that come up, like not just within, you know, the individual works, but how, you know, how they kind of, you know, converse with, with one another. So we, we do have a few, uh, we do have a few questions coming up. Um, 
So let's see. One question is, Nicholas, what was the name of your work that had the rabbits and the pheasants? There's right. a lot of rabbits and pheasants. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I think I think this person might be asking about the the like wooden pole toys because there was some pheasant imagery. Um, there was no rabbits, but uh, I, I have a feeling that's uh, that's what they're asking about. That piece was titled "Fair Game," and again, I kind of uh, made that work in response to learning about uh, driven uh, pheasant shooting in the UK, which is this kind of um, leisure activity where huntsmen um, kind of, from my understanding, they release pheasants and there's uh, pheasant beaters that scare them and basically they're slated for sort of target practice. Um, so I was kind of interested in, in that and the sort of, yeah, taking animal lives and turning them into a, um, you know, a leisure activity or, or play activity. Okay, we do have a, oh, hang on, he's, um, he's responded. Sorry, the question was about the work you talked about near the beginning of your presentation, right after Inanimate Beings. Oh, that, that piece was titled um, Nature Morte. Okay. After, yeah. Okay, um, there's a question here for Philippa, and that is, um, is there any inspiration or influence or reference to Francis Bacon's paintings in your work? Not, not directly, but I mean, Francis Bacon obviously like was an artist that had an impact on me, uh, especially in art school. Um, but yeah, no, I didn't uh, directly reference them. That's not to say like, going back to the question about research, I tend to explore widely everything I'm interested in and then have learned now to trust um, the art making process for those things to come back out. Uh, and yeah, could well be a bacon reference kind of in there. <laughs> um, we have a question for Emily. So what was your original reason for creating your sculptures? Uh, I'm, ass I'm assuming that this is refers to the work in Hunter Gatherer and I think, I think so. Yeah, that yeah, it's actually very much what 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 I was just saying to Nicholas and to Philippa that 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 idea of sort of pulling the thread like the image I think I just glanced across that um the Franz Snyder's painting and again I don't I don't have any particular relationship to the artist in general I have something of a relationship to that time period in art history just because it's something I'm drawn to as somebody who does sort of hyper realism and works with objects like living and dead um, but yeah, the, the, the idea of sort of like trying to recreate one of these tables physically, uh, was something that sort of showed up the idea fully formed, but the image really not at all. And I mean, it took a number of years to sort of work my way through it. So I had to, I don't know, hold the faith <laughs> for those couple of years that I wasn't just doing something completely random, but the more, because it was my thesis, I was reading alongside doing the work in the studio. And the more I read about the time, the more it kind of became clear that relation, like this sort of uneasy relationship between objects and, and travel and colonialism and, and, you know, the collapse of globalization. Um, it's all really in there. And I'd love to say I knew that at the beginning, but I really didn't <laughs> it like emerged in the research. Uh, we don't have a lot more questions, but I have a question for Liza. Liza, what time does your class end? <laughs> <laughs> we, we I'll just be like, I'll let this thing run, you know, like I'll just, you know, I'm so afraid to go out in the snow now that <laughs> I'm just going to yeah, stay here and talk. So what time does your class end? We're good for time. We go till 10. Oh, um, okay. Oh, yeah. I'm not going till 10. <laughs> no, no, it's long. No, we, we are going to continue after. Um, okay. But I, I did want to just maybe take a second to thank everybody and to also just, it's not really a question, but more of a comment is, um, I was really interested in this like overarching connection between all of your practices and the, the way that you've talked about them. Um, thinking about the, the sort of like the fragility of life um, uh, and how that kind of relates to your material choices. So like the materials like resins that, you know, are sort of like meant to last or this like collecting and rescuing of materials from landfills. Um, I was just sort of like struck by that sort of like poetic relationship or just like art in general, it's meant to be like archived and conserved. Um, yeah, so I just, I found the, the presentation really interesting and I'm, I'm really grateful that you were all be able to be here tonight and talk to us. So thank you very much.
So Nuriel is here. <laughs> she's, she's signed on and she has a question for Emily. Um, she says, Emily, I'm curious that you made no mention of the coded symbolism in the still life paintings that you reference. Do you want to answer uh, that or do we want Nuriel to elaborate further? Yeah, for sure you can el elaborate because there's a there's a ton of symbolism in all of those in all of those paintings that points in all of these different directions and I mean I would certainly never claim expertise on all of them, but I'm wondering if there's something in particular. Yeah, Nuriel, do you have uh do you have any other like a like a follow-up question or to uh to sort of clarify what you're what you're referring to? Let's see if she types in anything. This is one time when, you know, these Zoom things are weird. <laughs> we type, type questions. You could do a little song and dance. <laughs> it's not bad. We're, you know, we're doing, oh, wait, hang on. Okay, yes. Okay, so for example, uh, an object isn't always as it appears. Um, so does that come into play in your work? object isn't always as it appears I would agree <laughs> sorry I'm still not totally sure okay let me see if I read it that makes any more sense to me um I mean I guess what I can say just to answer there's I probably read 10 or 15 books or lengthy lengthy articles on the time period and there's there are layers and layers and layers and layers in those paintings and in the history that I'm obviously wouldn't get into in the 15 minute presentation. Some of it I did address in my thesis because it did get to be 108 pages long. So that is something that the link is there if you wanted to go and look through it, you're more than welcome to. Um, but I, I want for, I mean, and this is true for all work that I make, like I wanted to work on all of the different levels. I think Neil Gaiman was said something like, you know, in the Sandman graphic novel, like there's reference to like a, a billion D1 uh, pieces of mythology all over the world. And if you know that, great. And you'll see the references and they're in there. But if you don't, that you can still follow along the story and, and enjoy it the way that it functions at its surface. So I always, that stuck with me and I'm, I'm trying for that usually in my work. Sorry, that's a sneaky, like sideways answer. <laughs> Let's check the chat to see if we have any other questions there. We're getting sort of people are answering or asking things all over the place. Okay, wait, we do have another one. Okay, let's see. So um, Leland Harris has written, uh, I tried to phrase this as a question and couldn't figure out the words. Uh, for Philippa, I really appreciate the reflection on religion and how it affects views on death, even though you are not practicing anymore. Do you believe that your upbringing as Catholic affects your practice in conscious ways, or is it something that you notice when you look back on a piece? Hmm. Um. It's mostly unconscious, um, but at the same time, I try to be self-aware as I'm doing these things and be like, no, that's the Catholic in me as I do a thing. Um, so I don't necessarily like, uh, I don't do it with deliberation, I guess, but it um, it's there and I'm aware. And also because um, I'm trying like to live my life in a way that isn't in rejection of Catholicism but is uh because that in itself is uh, then I'm still being greatly influenced by it in a in a direct way but more um yeah I try to embrace wonder and questioning and not have any like um I, I don't know <laughs> where I'm going with it I'm talking I'm getting, getting too like uh uh reflective I guess but yeah. Um, so yeah, the upbringing definitely impacts everything um, and definitely impacts my work, especially it, the symbols and the visuals that I use. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, we have another question for Emily. Um, what drew you to using felt in your work? 
wool is a material that I was quite familiar with just sort of as a textiles person. But I think the thing that I like about it is that it is, it's something that can be harvested without killing the animal. And it's like, I say that as somebody who eats meat and buys leather, you know, and like deals in vintage fur and stuff like that. So it's, it's, it's not necessarily a moral stance, but just sort of from the point of view of sustainability. And like, I feel like fur, the quality that fur has to keep something warm is, is the only reason in my personal opinion, I feel like it's appropriate to take it from an animal. So the wool, because it regenerates and because it's something that, um, that I can work with sort of in terms of artistry to shape it into other things, like to, you know, to make it look like other animals. And that's almost like, I've had people tell me it's sort of like painting, like painting with wool, like the, the way that those surfaces end up because they're not very dimensional. They're actually pretty flat, but hopefully they look dimensional from a distance. Um, and I started being able to get some, uh, I wouldn't call it recycled wool, but basically discarded wool. Like if, if a sheep isn't kept a certain way and shorn at a certain time, often the wool ends up being unusable and but the sheep need to be shorn anyway. So it's actually in Newfoundland that I, I ended up picking up a couple of really big bags of wool from a farmer there who um, had broken her arm and wasn't able to shear in time. And so they ended up the sort of mess that was too matted for her to use to spin, but that I could use um, in sculpture. So I'm look, I'm moving into sort of avenues of, of trying to use some reclaimed wool that can't be used for other purposes too. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know that about the uh, the wool in Newfoundland that you were able to source. Yeah, th that's not in this, this, this show got made before I first went out there. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I mean, in now. general. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't know that uh, you were able to get that wool while you were in Newfoundland. Yeah. I don't know where I, I don't know what I thought you were doing out there. <laughs> Oh, we have another question. Mm, no, just have a, oh, wait, this is another one. Oh, we do have a question. Okay, this is from Tom Cole. Um, Emily, I'm interested in the link in your work between animals and objects, garbage, junk. Um, I think you said everything has a trajectory. And I just wondered if you'd say more about the lifespan of animals, objects, art. That is a really good question. I'm not sure I'd actually thought about it that way. When I was talking about trajectory, like particularly when you have secondhand objects or historical objects, they've come, they've had a lifetime, right? Like, and I think this is in all four of our work, right? Like it's, it's none of us are really intercepting these objects at their inception, right? Like they've existed in history, they've had lives. A lot of them that were mass produced are singular once they arrive at the value village or whatever, because the rest of them have been lost or destroyed or were just never lasted very long to begin with. Um, and the animals themselves, I don't know, I think I use animals in my work for a lot, some similar overlapping reasons to what Philippa was talking about in the beginning of her talk where you can argue that almost all art that is made by humans is somehow about the human experience, but making things wear human faces, like making things be people in your work. Like, I mean, for instance, it raises issues immediately of age, race, gender, class, like all of these things are, are, are impossible to, 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 to pull out of a human body once you've presented it, but you can approach a lot of the things you might talk about in the human world through the animal form and you know, for one thing, they are, I, I think of them as our kin. And I mean, I say that as, like I said, as somebody who eats animals, but, but that um, I don't feel we are quite as separate as the Western world has led us to believe that we are from the animal kingdom. So like, I think about them as little furry people or you know, people with wings or whatever. Um, but yeah, but there is that narrative possibility, right, where you can sort of you know, that's why I think so many of the myths and fables were were told with 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 sort of animal protagonists as opposed to human ones, right? Because you can get at certain things differently if you can come at them from the side. That makes any sense. And I think objects allude to our history and our 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 own personal trajectories in a similar way, but again, coming at it sort of at an angle. That makes sense. So Tom, who uh, just asked that question, he teaches here at Western mm -hmm. and he's going to be bringing, um, he's bringing his class to do a nature writing workshop um, at, at the gallery uh, during the show. So yes. I'm you know, quite excited <laughs> about that and to see uh -huh. how the students respond to, uh, to the work. 
Uh, there's another sort of a more of a more of a comment than a question uh, from Nouriel uh, to Philippa, and she's just uh, sort of thinking about the the tradition of artists uh, looking at dead things to learn anatomy and um, and have subjects that don't move. And she's just wondered if you sort of you know you've thought about uh, your practice from that perspective and just I guess. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I think that. Um also in the kind of unflinching eye of the artist, like we tend to just look at things head on that other people might look away from. So yeah, we will look at the dead bodies and the things that are too gross or um, not socially um, appropriate. We'll kind of like look at those things head on, I guess. And then, uh, yeah, bring them back to the public. Um, just thinking too about what Emily was just talking about with uh, uh, objects having a trajectory. And one of the things that like, when you're talking about stuff going to um, kind of rescuing things from ending up in, in junk. And I've been thinking a lot about how, what, now that I've put all these organic things into resin orbs, like are they going to actually exist forever somewhere and is someone going to dig up a pile of orbs in like 500 years time and be like what the hell <laughs> <laughs> thing and I think a lot about how I have like as a consequence of making this work then also like created this weird piece in time that is going to exist in the future too um, and maybe that can be kind of some way in which I have a final iteration of the, this body of work is like I bury it somewhere or I do yeah and deliberately affect the trajectory you know <laughs> um while I'm waiting to see if anybody sends in any more questions I'll just uh, comment on um you know you were saying that artists are willing to look at things that are, are more difficult than uh than a lot of other people are willing to look at. And while Philippa was preparing her her uh, her PowerPoint for this, she sent me an image and and said, you know, is it too graphic? And I'm like, oh no, I think it's fine. <laughs> and then we realized, like, I am not a good barometer <laughs> for this. So we um, we had Abby um, uh, vet it <laughs> for us, so to speak, and decided that it was in fact it was too bloody it was actually I mean to be fair it was there was quite a bit of it was quite it was quite um it was it was pretty bloody yeah I mean it's I really beautiful though this big like swoosh of blood across a um the like steel dissection table and then the dead body like it there's something very like <laughs> compelling visually about it as as gross as it was too yeah yeah I know um, I don't know. It looks like maybe we're gonna slip this. We don't. I don't think we're having any more questions. I'm just gonna tuck this little window over there for a moment, and uh, so we can see everybody. Do you guys have any questions for each other? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> Emily, when are you coming back to Newfoundland? <laughs> Maybe in the summer, I'm hoping. <laughs> Catherine's going to be out there, I'm hoping. Yes. Nicholas, when are you going for the first time? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I've never been to Newfoundland, that's true. You should go. You come. Yeah. You've got friends there now. Group residency. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be very cool. Yeah. Yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, if there aren't any more questions, this is like everybody's kind of, um, if anybody's got a question, ask it now, because if you don't, I am gonna wrap this up. Um, I don't see anything coming in. Um, yeah, so I'm going to, uh, I'm gonna call, I'm gonna call this a night. And thank you all for participating and for being here and for being so, just awesome and insightful and fascinating. And I mean, speaking for myself, like I loved it, um, which is of no surprise, but yeah, I loved it. And I hope that the students enjoyed it too. And, um, oh wait, I see something, hang on, there might be another question coming in. 
Oh, no, just just Tom saying that he's looking forward to bringing his students, which I'm very excited for Tom to come with his students. Um, yeah, so, you know, thank you. Thank you again for all of this. And I'm going to wrap it up. And again, I'm going to remind the students in art now to stick around uh, to talk to Liza. Um, and I guess Liza can continue teaching her class in, in whatever way, uh, in whatever way you do after I, you know, we disappear. Thanks, Helen. <laughs> <laughs> And thanks for helping to organize this and uh, co-present everything. It's been really wonderful to partner with uh, the Macintosh uh, on these panel discussions. They're really great. So, and thank you again to the artists. Uh, it was wonderful to hear you guys.